Hi everyone, welcome to this episode of the Sports Psych Show. Today's guest is Dr. Martin Turner. Martin is a senior lecturer in sports psychology at Staffordshire University. His consultancy is extremely wide-ranging. In football, he's lead psychologist for the English futsal team, and he's worked at Premier League and Championship Football Academies, including Nottingham Forest and Stoke City. He's worked in a diverse range of sports, including cricket, rugby, volleyball, cycling and archery. Martin is interested in using a counselling framework called Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy, or REBT for short, and he uses this approach to improve the performance and enhance the mental health of competitors from all sports. In this episode, Martin and I talk about how coaches can use REBT. We talk about the relationship between thoughts, feelings and performance, and we discuss the problem with using extreme language. We also talk about developing flexible thinking and how to embrace helpful negatives. It's a really great episode and I do think Martin will get you thinking about how to help your players approach their competitive play. So introducing Dr. Martin Turner on the Sports Psych Show. So today I am speaking with Dr. Martin Turner. Uh, I'm really excited to be speaking with Martin because I have uh, a real interest as a sports psychologist in a psychological framework called Rational Emotive Behaviour Therapy. Um, We shorten that to REBT. And I just think it's such, it has such a powerful uh, philosophical message. It Ha- at the heart of it, it has powerful tools and techniques that I think players can use themselves, that coaches uh, need to incorporate into their day-to-day activities, their approach, their conversations with players, and it's also relevant and pertinent to parenting your sports child as well. Martin, uh, welcome to the Sports Psych Show. It's great to have you on. Hi, Dan. Thanks for the invite. No problem at all. Right. Well, um, I've I've kind of introduced what you what you do or the approach you take, the research you research a lot in rational motive behaviour therapy and using that in a sports setting in a sporting context. But what would be really really good because I'm I'm aware that I'm using these long words rational emotive behaviour therapy and there might be some people going well, what is that about you know I just want to get the golf ball in the hole or I want to kick it in the goal or defend my goal or, or whatever. Sport Sport you play. So, could you give us just a brief, basic background as to, you know, what rational motive behaviour therapy is, how you use it as a sports psychologist, and maybe how it can benefit coaches and players alike? Yeah, definitely. Um, RBT is something that um, I think we sort of came across five, six, seven years ago, and one of the reasons that I across it personally is because of the language that I was hearing. Um, particularly at an academy football level. And I'll get into that detail a bit later, but the the language I was hearing from players sort of drove me to explore what does this language mean and how do I deal with this language and the thoughts that might be underpinning it. And, and through that, that investigation, I sort of stumbled upon uh, rational emotive behaviour therapy. Um, so my personal background from a sports science background, I haven't really been edited too deeply in counseling approaches Mm -hmm. um i knew what cognitive behavior therapy was but i hadn't i I didn't know what rebt was so rebt is regarded as the first cognitive behavioral therapy and basically what that means is that there is a a connection between how people think uh what they believe and their subsequent behaviors and emotions and the rbt is important because at the time that it was developed by Dr. Albert Ellis um, in New York in the 50s, it was going against a, a different kind of approach that many psychotherapists were taking, which was a more Freudian psychodynamic approach. So it was a bit of a, a, a game changer at that time. You know, subsequent, subsequently, we've come through um, many significant, I would say, revolutions in, in psychology, and particularly in sports psychology, and cognitive behavioral therapies is, is really... Um, one of the most popular frameworks and approaches 
and RBT sits nicely within that. It is about how we think, how we feel, how we behave, and ultimately how those things coalesce um, and interact to produce a performance. So but I think bearing that in mind, that's kind of what we work with with, with athletes, the thoughts, beliefs, um, and, and try to help them to have um, the most helpful, beneficial, facilitated beliefs as they possibly can for performance. So I'm going to bring you back to something you said right at the beginning there, language. The language I heard at a football academy, and again, we could replace this for, I dare say, a tennis academy, a, a golf academy, young golfers, young tennis players, young rugby players, baseball players. So what language, what specific language did, did you hear, Martin? I heard quite... Um, extreme, inappropriate, rigid language that didn't seem to fit the context. Language like terrible performances, devastated players. I heard about must wins. Um, I heard about being losers, it's failures. And, and this is what the, what the players were using to describe themselves and their own performances and also their team performances. And it's very easy within certain cultures and contexts, and sport is one of those, to get swept along with the language and, and to start to um, use and appropriate the language and not really understand what that language is really speaking to. But when somebody says something like something's terrible, then that, that's a completely inappropriate way to describe an endeavour such as sport. And um, terrible brings to mind, you know, natural disasters, losing a loved one, you know, life and death. When we talk about that in a sport context, what we're doing there is we're adding pressure and we're adding unnecessary uh, jeopardy to, to, to the pursuits um, that we're trying to aim towards. So w- when I started to hear that language, it kind of, yeah, I, I suppose a light went off in my head around, well, how do I challenge this language? This is so much a part of the culture. What can I do to challenge that? Um, and that's really when I started to, to, to understand more about REBT. So what I hear you say there, Martin, is that, that, that what you uh, experienced it with with young players and, and, and whether it's fueled by coaches or, or they spoke in the same way is having uh, having language revolve around must, I must win. Mm. Um, having awfulizing language, so it would be terrible if we lose. I played terrible. This is awful. This is this is horrendous. So, and, and I know from my own research that if we go back to uh, that uh, that founding father, uh, Dr. Albert Ellis, who is one of the most influential psychologists of all time, isn't he? He he said that there's it, it, there's lots of uh, uh, types of dysfunctional thinking, but musts awfulizing and overgeneralizing are the main three and mm. what i hear you say is that you heard a lot of a lot of those and and also what i hear you say is well okay so so we've got we've got that that dysfunctional thinking within the culture within the individual and that adds pressure and and i think that what what i dare say you've heard from coaches historically the last five six seven years is that well yeah but if a young player wants to be the best that they can be, if they if they if they want to go on and maybe compete at top amateur level or professional level, then the reality is is there's a lot of pressure anyway, and they they need to know that they have to win. They need to know that they've got to be really good, and they can't afford to have terrible performances. So, what are some of the conversations you may have had uh, with coaches around that sort of tr- trying to push back on those arguments? Yeah, it's a good point. It's something that has been challenging over the past six or seven years, as you pro- can probably sort of uh, understand and connect with. But the, the main argument I get from, from coaches and players is that if I take away my musts and I take away my description, this is terrible and I'm an idiot when I fail, then I'll somehow become less motivated. This is based... This is based on a very basic understanding of motivation that it that it's either high or low what we know about motivation is it's multi-dimensional um if we think about self-determination theory which indicates there's different types of motivation qualities that we want to be want to be triggering in the athletes that we're working with and we want athletes to draw on one of the things we know about musts is that it it represents quite an external motivator you're pressurizing the self 
It's called introjected regulation. You're pressurizing yourself to do something. And what you're also saying by saying that because I've failed, I'm a failure. Because I've underperformed, I'm a loser. Is you're saying that your self-worth is contingent on your performance. It's, those it's, it's beliefs, dependent on your performance, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and those beliefs are not conducive to long-term performance. In the short term, if I'm in the last... 200 meters of a marathon and i'm saying to myself i must you know i must succeed i must succeed i must succeed there's a valid argument that that might help me you know in in that moment but what we know is that long term those beliefs are not going to help me to achieve what i want to um, achieve for lots of reasons to do with um well-being you know more holistically but that continuous pressure that i'm putting on myself how long can an athlete deal with that and also, at what cost do we expect athletes to, to deal with that? So I think it's worth, as, as coaches, being mindful of when we're using that language and trying to teach our athletes to conduct something that I like to call double think. Choose the beliefs that you think will work um, in specific moments in time. And that, that double think is a George Orwell um, yep. concept from his, um, from his um, literature. Can we help athletes to choose when to use these musts when they're appropriate, but actually when they're away from that sport in that performance context, can they have more flexible uh, beliefs that help them in terms of well-being and help them in terms of longevity of performance? Would you say it's healthy, um, just dwelling on the musts here, you know, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about the conversations I've had historically and, and, and where one can direct the musts where coaches can have that absolute language, if you like, that, that communication around the absolutes, would it be useful, say, to, to, to help performers direct their muscles onto the things that they can control, the, the, the things that they have choice around? I think one of the things that we should probably flag up is that there's no, there's no actual evidence that these types of thoughts can benefit performance at all okay. in the short term or in the long term. Yep. We just simply don't have enough data. All I can speak from is, I suppose, my own personal experience and, and athletes um, use these types of thoughts and beliefs to get the best out of themselves in very acute situations, whether that's when they're in a really difficult training session, whether they're trying to get themselves through um, a particularly tough um, spell, of, spell of a match or a game. But, but the really resilient athletes that I work with are the ones that can separate themselves from those thoughts and beliefs and they, they can say I'm going to use these thoughts and beliefs to get me out of a bit of a bind yeah. and, to, and to drive me in a certain setting but as soon as I step away I'm very flexible I don't have to succeed when, I'm, when I fail it's okay it's not the end of the world I can move on I can, I can develop athletes that are able to, to to have those both sides from my experience seem to be able to um, be healthier around their approach to performance yeah you, you know when you talk about that short term that acute situation it reminds me of a, a story i've used in one of my books uh, about the uh, ten thousand meter runner billy mills and it's going way back to the 1968 olympics and it's a wonderful story and actually uh, anybody listening can go on youtube and just type in billy mills and and, and he recounts the story of how you know he was a uh, 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 a real outsider but did, had this wonderful training plan um but then that, that training plan was topped off by during the race i think it, it was between him and coming into the sort of the final lap it was between him and Mah- a guy called Mohammed gamuji i think his name was and a, a kiwi guy called ron clark and it got to the last corner and they were all together and billy mills said i just found myself talking to myself and just saying I'm going to win, I'm going to win, I'm going to win. I've, and, and into that last 100 metres, I've won, I've won, I've won, I've won. And I suppose my interpretation of that, in that acute situation, he's he's used his self-talk, uh, an extreme version of self-talk, to sort of drive himself, to energise himself at a time when energy is going to be quite low and drive himself through to that 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 finish line. Um, whereas if we if we track back and, and, and think of his preparation, he certainly probably wasn't speaking like that 
in the lead up to the race it was more he talks more about scientifically breaking down the race and rationally thinking about okay i can do this lap in this time and and trying to improve his his fitness his times to to, to get better so i i i absolutely resonate with this notion of short term mid term and long term useful language in that acute short term could be quite extreme could be seen mm. as quite dysfunctional whereas if we pull back to the long term it's just it, it, it's coming away from that having more functional having more helpful language yeah oh, definitely and, and actually one of the things i've seen um with practitioners who just start to use rbt principles is they will focus purely on the rationality and logic of the language and what we know from rbt and other approaches is that we look at the the truth of the the belief the logic of the belief but also the pragmatics is it helpful and if I'm working with an athlete who tells me that this particular belief, no matter how irrational it is, no matter how many musts and terribles and I'm a failure and I can't stand it, there is, if that is helpful for my performance in that moment, then I can't classify that as dysfunctional because it's helping them in, in, in that moment. Um, whereas if the, if the athlete says, no, 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 it's, you know, it, it's, it's not helpful for my performance, it's hindering me, then that's a different story. Then I would classify as that dysfunctional try to work with them to change that belief. But we always have to come back to, is it helping the athlete achieve what they want to achieve in the short term and in the long term? And I think that's something to kind of hang your hat on a little bit. When you do hear some of this language, it's worth stopping and thinking and having a conversation with the athlete around, well, is it useful? Is it functional for that performance? I think the challenge for sports competitors for young sports competitors for for young sports competitors who want to be the very best that they can be who sort of look up to whether it's the premier league or the atp tour or the pga tour whatever sport they're competing in is you know they 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 want it so badly they want it so much so many of them that it's so difficult for them to so challenging for them to detach that emotion and then they may have coaches around them who celebrate that emotion who celebrate it i mean you've alluded to already that motivation is multi-dimensional but um when it's seen in it from a one-dimensional perspective you know they celebrate that emotion <coughs> he really wants it she really wants it you know she's so yeah. driven he's so driven and it's so challenging to detach ourselves from that day-to-day -day emotion of trying to be the best that we can be and we're kind of almost socialized into got to win got to win got to win got to perform got to perform got to perform got to perform and this by but the, the, this rational language you're talking about almost feels so alien to sport almost feels like it, it shouldn't exist that it shouldn't be part of sports performance and preparation to perform yeah it's an interesting point and one of the dangers um of using rbt is that we replace things like i must succeed with i want to succeed i want to succeed it just doesn't sound motivational you know, it doesn't sound like it's going to drive me towards something. Yeah. It's, it's completely appropriate and rational and powerful to say, I want to succeed more than anything in the world. This is so important. You know, I want this. I really, really want this more than anything. You are still being rational. You're still not placing uh, musts and demands. You're still able to drive yourself on to, to achieve something you want to achieve. What we're not saying is that individuals have to be rational robots that just say, yeah, well, I want it, but, you know, it, it, if it doesn't happen, I don't care, it doesn't matter. That is that is not really the, the sentiment of RBT. That's the sentiment of RBT if we, if we take it in its very, very basic form. But in reality, people have very, very strong desires and preferences. They have very strong beliefs about themselves when they fail. What we're trying to do is, is help the individual um, to use beliefs that are strong but not extreme, not rigid, that are useful. Um, and in doing that, we can still use pretty evocative language as long as we don't, um, as long as it doesn't bleed into most terrible, I can't stand it, I'm a complete failure. You know, there, there's a balance there to be had. Yeah, I mean, is there any room for, let's say I, I, I'm, I'm a young footballer, I've lost a game, I've lost the cup final. And um, again, we, we, I've been in coaches of professional teams and quite prominent professional teams on the way back from, the, from a match where where 
the game's been lost and everybody's socialised into silence. You've got to be silent, and and because if you're not silent, you're not seen, you're not deemed to be caring about it. Um, it's yeah. absolutely ridiculous, really, when you when you start to talk about it. But uh, this is the thing, and, and you've men- mentioned being, you know, that kind of robotic belief or robotic response is. What are you saying, Martin? I mean, when we're in that coach on the way back, uh, are you saying that actually it's something we can celebrate no matter what? Are you saying that uh, we should just get on with things and just have a have a casual chat? Um, is there any room for being disappointed? Well, what what's the balance there? It's a good question. I mean, I mean, what what how I would work? I mean, yeah. very much in an REBT way is to embrace negative emotions. In RBT, we have this, this this framework which is called the binary um, sort of binary model of emotional distress, and that binary model suggests that in any given situation, we have kind of two different ways of responding. One is with a, a helpful negative emotion; the other is an unhelpful negative emotion or unhealthy negative emotion. RBT is not um, a, a framework or model of positive emotions it does include some but even from from the early days it is it is about how do we use some of that negativity it's a theory of how do we deal with adversity and by nature that includes some some negative emotions what what we're really saying is that even if those emotions feel negative as long as they're not stepping over into dysfunctional unhealthy negatives where we're losing players for days on end and they're withdrawing and they're constantly wallowing then embrace that negative emotion we can learn a lot from those emotions you know um, it, it can change our behavior it can adapt it can teach us that we need to improve it can help us to learn things and there is um there is some satisfaction to be gained in a collective wallowing uh, uh, you know a collective negative emotion um and to support each other through that so i would not advocate any sort of feigned uh, positivity more than acceptance and openness um, around those negative emotional responses. So embrace negative emotion after a performance that's been that's been poor, that's been lost. It, it's again, there's a line here, isn't there? It, it's okay to be disappointed. It's okay to be gutted. It's okay to be um, to reflect back on the performance and reflect in a manner that says, yeah, that really wasn't good enough. I really could have done better there, and I'm disappointed with myself. But as you say, it's when that it, when that external or internal language catastrophizes, awfulizes. This is terrible. This is disgraceful. I'm no good. That's when it becomes dysfunctional on that that's when it doesn't help you as a, a a striving athlete or an elite athlete in the moment and and moving forward in the next week or two weeks and then it can have knock-on effects to your well-being as well exactly it, it, it's going to be much much tougher to come back i mean one of the things that, that rbt talks about in terms of resilience is that we, we don't really talk about bouncing back because we're not bouncy balls and we don't come back to our original state we come back and what, the extent to which we come back stronger or not is, is you know, out, out for debate. But the point being that I can, I can fast forward, I, I can increase the speed at which I'm able to come back to be ready to perform again if my beliefs, my reaction to that situation is more balanced and more rational. If I'm catastrophizing, it's going to increase not only the intensity of what I'm feeling, it's also going to increase the duration of those feelings. And, and then we're going to start to struggle to come back to train with a positive mental attitude and come back to perform and, and try to clear our minds from some of the, the mistakes that we made. But also, you know, one of the most damaging or dangerous beliefs that we're finding in, in our research and in applied practice yeah. is the idea of depreciation or self-downing. This is that, that contingent self-worth that we touched on earlier, which is because I've underperformed, I'm a complete idiot. Because I didn't do so well, then I'm a complete failure. That seemed to be particularly damaging and it is linked to feelings of depression and it's highly linked to feelings of anxiety. Those beliefs are very dangerous because as an athlete, you will fail a lot. You know, you will underperform, you will disappoint yourself, you disappoint others. That's part of the learning process. 
in reaction to those setbacks, if every time you're saying that because I've failed, I'm a complete failure, it's going to be very difficult to come back from those things and, and to approach performance in a positive way the next time around. It's very paradoxical, isn't it, as a sports performer? One needs to, I feel that one needs to embrace that notion that, you know, I, I will fail at some point. I, in fact, I'm going to fail a lot. I'm going to fail a lot during the game. I'm going to fail a lot in the next few weeks. Um, that's just part of that's just part of the form of life of of sport, uh, especially in competitive sport. And that's okay. It's almost giving yourself permission to fail. It's giving your your players permission to fail. Um, I, I think that's so important. So what I hear you say. Be careful of language. Be careful of words. If you're a coach, monitor what you're saying to your players. Reflect upon what you're saying to players. If you're a competitor yourself, if you're a young player or an elite athlete yourself, be careful what you're saying to yourself or reflect on what you're saying to yourself. If you're you're awfulizing, if you're generalizing... If your language, inner language, external language revolves around must, I must be this, I must be that, then you're leading yourself down a path, or you're leading your players down this path of um, dysfunction, lack of self-worth, potential depression in the future. But from a performance perspective, it's going to be challenging for you to continue to progress and perform in your sport when you have kind of dysfunctional language. So, yeah, exactly. The, the way that I look at it is, as a coach, would you prefer to have athletes that really, really want to succeed, or would you prefer to have athletes that feel like they they must, and it's life and death every time? And coaches might have a question differently. What we know from a from a long term perspective, if we're looking to develop athletes who have long term careers, then we want them to to want to be the best, not feel like they have to be, because that that life and death approach can only take you so far. And even if you do make it to the top of the sport and and you know achieve great things, there is a price to be paid for having these beliefs. We have enough evidence now from sport and from loads of other um, areas that endorsing these beliefs over a long period of time will cause all kinds of mental and physical health problems. So I always ask the question, at what price are we going to um, encourage these dysfunctional beliefs in athletes, even if it does lead some of them to produce good performances, you know, at what cost? Um, so I think it's about short-termism versus long-termism. Can we help athletes? You know, as coaches, can you encourage athletes to use beliefs for certain for certain situations to get the best out of yourself? And encourage them when they're away from that to have different, healthier beliefs. And I, and I really, truly think that that's the key, really to help athletes to make choices. It, it's all about choice. What do I choose to think and believe in this situation? Um, if we can teach them to be anonymous over the things they think think and believe, then really we've, I think we've kind of got to a point where athletes can drive their own um, performances. Healthy beliefs and flexible thinking. Um, I think uh, flexible thinking for me in, in my work, when I think of my work, I mean, I actually did a, a mini article the other day on LinkedIn and I said I'm often, as a sports psychologist, you're often confused as being the uh, positive the positive thinking guy, the guy who comes in or the girl who comes in, the woman who comes in and, and, and helps people to think positively. But um, on the contrary, I... I it personally, in my work, the way I, I, I talk about it is, is, is flexible thinking. Um, the ability to sort of look up and down that optimism, pessimism, um, positive, negative uh, thinking continuum and adopt the most appropriate form of thinking at that given time. And as you say, in the heat of battle, it might be that I have to be a mindless optimist. It might be coming down the stretch that I have to talk to myself in a way that drives me on, that surges my nervous system and releases the kind of chemicals that helps me take those those strides in a quicker way. But day to day, if I want to progress my uh, ability, my skill level... Um, I need to potentially, you know, I certainly have to look at the tips without, you know, I have to look at what I have to search and look in amongst my performances and look at what needs to go better. You know, and if I take extreme language into that, I, I work with so many 
Um, I've worked with so many footballers who have said, well, I don't want to explore the negative. I don't want to explore the things that don't work for me or, or, or are, are perceived as weaknesses because that's too scary. You know, if I get lost there, then I'm going to diminish my confidence. And that's, that, that's always quite frustrating for me as a practitioner because when you want to help somebody improve, um, I think it is about being able to be flexible enough to look at what's strong, where you can derive confidence from, and but also look at the areas you, that you need to improve, have that flexible thinking, look at those areas, explore them and examine them, and search for what you can do to get better at those areas. So flexible thinking appears to me to be that sort of optimal form of cognition. Yeah, definitely. I mean, RBT is pretty much uh, what we call a metacognitive theory. How, how able are you to think about thoughts? And if we're developing athletes who have a high metacognitive ability, they're able to assess and critically analyze and choose their own thoughts, then you are trying to, to, to get them to, to be more flexible about their thinking, to, to choose to be very rigid and extreme in this area acutely, but to choose outside of that to be to have very flexible and, and, and healthy beliefs. Um, how, can, a key how, part, I think. how can... Martin, how can how can players, how can competitors improve their meta skills? So by that I mean improve their ability to think about their thinking. One of the key aspects um, in starting to explore that area is helping individuals or, or trying to recognise that when something happens to you or somebody says something to you or you face a difficult situation, the event itself does not trigger your emotions. It's what you say to yourself that triggers those emotions. As soon as you recognize that, so in RBT we call that the ABC, the A being the situation, the B being your thoughts and beliefs, the C being the emotion, um, the emotional consequences. As soon as you can help people to understand that it's themselves that makes themselves feel angry, makes themselves feel anxious, you start to lead them towards greater metacognition. Because what they're, what they're then exploring is they're then introspecting, they're looking within themselves and they're saying, well, what did I say to myself that, that caused that anxiety? What were the thoughts that I had that, that led to that anger? Um, once they're asking those questions, instead of, how do I avoid that situation because it makes me anxious? How do I avoid that person because they make me angry? Once they start to ask, well, what am I doing? What am I bringing to the party that's contributing to my own emotions? then that, that opens up all sorts of doors and can help them to be much more metacognitive. So from a from practical perspective, is a useful thing that a, that a competitor can do is to say at the end of the day or when they're going back on public transport or in the car um, from, a let's say, a training session uh, to, to spend five minutes uh, – in self-reflection but when I say self-reflection I'm not just talking about what well, how did that go and what went well and what could have gone better not just reflecting on the performance but reflecting on mindset and discriminating between the situation the situations that happened on the pitch or the court or the course um, what they thought about um, those situations and the emotions they experienced as a consequence of those thoughts. Definitely. And be really structured as well. And using the ABC framework, saying, okay, what was the situation that I was in? What was the emotion I experienced or the behavior that I displayed? Yep. Getting some real detail around those things. Like, well, what, what really did happen? And what really were the emotions? What were the physical aspects I felt? Yep. Um, and then filling in the bit in the middle and saying, okay, I have a good understanding of A and C. What did I bring to the party? What was, I, what was I telling myself about that situation that really led to those emotions? Um, using that as a, as, a, as a structured framework for self-reflection means that not only are you enhancing that metacognitive ability, mm. you give yourself somewhere to go next. Because if you recognize that the belief caused the emotion and you've accessed your belief and you've recognized what you're saying to yourself, you have a clear indication of what to change. You know, you don't change the situation. You don't just try to change the emotion. You change the thought and belief to, to cause those particular changes. And that's a really key part, I think. I think it, additionally, within the moment as well. So 
we're doing a lot of research in golf um, at the moment, and particularly uh, my PhD student Nan Key and MSc student I had called Dave Ewan. They're taking golfers um, onto the course, going with them on a on a, a practice round, and putting them in particular situations that the golfer has a fear of, yep. as a, has a phobia of, and, and you know can't seem to get over that particular shot. Purposely putting them in that situation in um, in practice rounds as a form of exposure, and then asking them, okay, what are you telling yourself about this situation that is causing anxiety that's affecting the shot? Using that as a tool, but also taking them back to that situation afterwards, using some visualization to say, well, take yourself back to that tricky situation. What were you telling yourself that was causing the emotions you felt? So it's definitely, as you said there, reflection is, is key. Um, mixing some visualization with that to, to make it really real, but also taking opportunities in sports like golf and, and tennis where you do have natural breaks to use some of this these techniques to, to question what am I telling myself and what can I say differently? That sounds fantastic in golf. Let, let's take a, a sport like football, for instance, which is a fast, instinctive sport. So what I hear you say is a coach can potentially have a conversation with a player who, let's say that player experiences a lot of frustration at themselves and that frustration leads to um, just a, a, a dip in form. Perhaps they become less aware of what's going on around them on the pitch. They're slower to anticipate. They make poor decisions. Their body language drops and their physical functioning um, uh, depreciates so a coach can can have a conversation with the player and, and rather than just saying to this player well look, you, you, you can't get frustrated you can't afford to get frustrated i mean it's ridiculous that you get frustrated you know you need to you forget you need to forget it and move on which kind of rationally may may or may not be the truth but it, it, if we were to use more of this framework it's a coach going through a process of questioning this player about, OK, what circumstances on the pitch do you start to get frustrated? Well, coach, I start to get frustrated when I give the ball away. I, I, I get so angry with myself because I don't want to do that. OK, well, so what 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 do you what do you tend to when you give the ball away? What do you tend to thinking about? What what, um, what thoughts go through through your head or what experiences do you have through your body? What are you feeling at that time? And so on and so forth. So the coach has a conversation around this. And maybe from an exposure point of view, you can create a scenario in an activity where maybe you turn up the volume of the challenge of the activity. So it's inevitable that this player is going to give the ball away. And then during that activity, you can dive in and you can help that player be more rational in that moment. Would that be a kind of a useful process to go through? Definitely. Uh, I think... And I've, I've, probably, is, I've probably missed some steps there, but I'm, you know, I'm just trying to get the point across. Yeah, it, 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 I, I think in general, um, the idea of exposing players to certain situations yeah. and helping them to, to, to question what led to certain emotions is really, really key. The, the key question in IBT is what are you telling yourself about that situation that is leading to how you're feeling now? And the real tricky part is, is when do you choose to have that conversation um, do you set up training drills that, that creates that situation for the player so you can take that teachable moment? Is it something that you can you can develop um, so well with the player that you're able to use in the on pitch? Can you is it possible to you know to utter what are you telling yourself to calm them down and to get them to, to self regulate in the moment? But also, you know, the sport the sport that I work with most is uh futsal. And so the head coach at England futsal would, would set up drills, situations that, in, that include pressure and include some jeopardy. Mm -hmm. And not only does it mean that the player is having to self-regulate because the game moves so quickly, they're also watching others self-regulate and watching um, peers, teammates, role models. How do they deal with it when they make a mistake? How do they deal with it when they give the ball away? And behaviour of others can, can shape our own behaviour. And it's sometimes it's getting into the nitty of thoughts is not possible in a, in a live environment. So actually what you're looking at is your key role models on the team, your key leaders. You want them to be responding well to mistakes. You want them to be coming back really quickly. Um, and I think, so, it, so it's a, a joined up approach, isn't it, I suppose? Um, it's something that you have to be able to affect the culture um, to allow players to react in the best possible way, especially to uh, mistakes. But just going back slightly 
one of the things that I would do with athletes, we talked about the situation, so you know, you gave the ball away. One of the things that we can do is something called downward arrow or inference chaining. And what we do with the athlete is, is ask them, so what if you gave the ball away? What's so bad about that? And typically, the, the con- I'll give you an example of a, of a typical conversation for that scenario. So gave the ball away, so what? Well, it means that my performance will be worse. Okay, so what if it's worse? Maybe, you know, people have a, a negative opinion of me as an athlete. Okay, so what if that's the case? What if, you know, they don't value me as, as an athlete anymore and, and then I'm not selected, then I'm on the bench? Okay, well, so what? What if I don't start again? What if I don't get any game time? Well, so what? What if I have to leave the club because I'm, I'm not being selected? So you keep going down and what you find very quickly is the athlete is able to go to some real deep depths and you end up getting to the real thing that's triggering some of that anger and some of that emotion. And quite often it's, well, that's it, my career will be over and I'll be worthless and I'll be nothing and it'll be terrible. So you go from giving the ball away very quickly all the way down to it would ruin me as an athlete. And that's that's a typical example. The conversation will obviously go differently with um, depending on who you're working with, but the idea of inference chaining, helping the athlete to go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper to understand, well, where is this anger coming from, means that, again, they're able to be more metacognitive and access the thoughts that are really triggering some of this anger instead of the surface-level stuff. This happened. I felt angry. You know, can we get them away from that and, and go into a bit more depth? It's amazing, isn't it? Because as you were speaking there and you were sort of talking about a negative, you were alluding to a negative thought chain, you know, the deeper and deeper you go. And I've had conversations with coaches over the years and uh, sometimes those coach, those conversations can be, um, dare I say, exasperating because coaches don't always realise where players, where their, where their minds can go, where that inner conversation can go. It can go to some quite deep places, but places where you feel are almost uh, irrelevant to the situation situation but uh, as albert ellis said i mean we have this this talent this tendency this biological de- tendency towards this destructive dysfunctional thinking and um i always say to coaches you've got to strive to look at the world through the player's eyes look at the uh, feel the feelings that they might be experiencing um Predict the thoughts that they might have as a consequence of what you say to them. I think that's such an important part of coaching is putting yourself into the world of your athlete, your player. Definitely. And it's understanding that when when they do talk to you on a one-to-one level and they are going into some depth, it's making sure that as a coach or as a practitioner, as as a psychologist, that you are on the same page with them in terms of language. Because just because they say... You know, I always feel like I have to succeed and I always feel like it's terrible to fail. They might not mean the same thing that we mean. They might, when you start talking to them, they might soften that a little bit and they might say, well, I, you know, I don't really think it's terrible. Or, well, I don't have to, but they use it in the moment because they're frustrated and uh, depend on what kind of conversation you have with them. So I think a useful approach is to to be really open with an athlete and say, when you say this, Tell me what you mean when you use that word. So you can get a shared understanding of when they use certain words because you could end up challenging a must when they're not really using must in the same way that that we would consider in an REBT way because, you know, the world exists outside of theory and and psychological approaches. So getting on the same page is massive as a coach and as a practitioner because if then – you're able to interpret their language accurately, then you really can start to predict how somebody might react in a situation and what they might be saying to themselves and what the consequences might be. Until you get that shared understanding, then it's very difficult to make that prediction, isn't it? I was speaking with uh, a guy called Doug Love. Um, I don't know if you've you've heard of him, but he's a, he, he teaches teachers how to teach more effectively. In essence, um, he's got a couple of great great books out there. Teach like a champion, and we were talking about um, what he calls uh, building a culture of error and psychological safety. So the culture, trying to build a culture within your sporting organisation, within your sporting team or 
within your squad a culture of it's okay to make mistakes it's okay to to make errors um, it's okay to be honest if you don't understand something that's vital in the classroom it's for me it's imperative within um, within sporting organizations sporting clubs does some of this stuff um, if I build a culture of error does it lessen, does it turn down the volume of dysfunctional thinking? If I as a coach um, build this culture of error, if I allow players to make mistakes, allow allow error to be a big part of our culture, it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay at times to get frustrated. It's, as you say, in some negative emotion. It's okay at times to have anxieties and doubts and worries. You know, normalising those thoughts and feelings if you like um does that turn down the volume of dysfunctional thinking some of this does some of this almost become relevant as a consequence of creating that kind of adaptive culture i think the the, i suppose the rather complex and mysterious answer to that is yes and no (laughs) (laughs) because you know if if we take a if we take a, a standpoint an rbt standpoint then it technically it wouldn't matter what you do to the environment because it's the individual's beliefs about what happens so you could fail a hundred times or you could fail once if you believe that failure makes you a failure they've got issues but if you're giving i'm sorry to interject and i'm probably preempting what you said but if you're giving permission to make mistakes surely that turns down the volume of emotion surely that lessens the chance of disturbance i think teaching players to accept themselves through failure is, is a key element rather than accept the failure. So judge behaviors, not people. So you might have failed 30 times in training drill. We're not, we're not asking you to accept failure. We're asking you to accept yourself for having failed and recognize that you're just a fallible, normal human being. I mean, some of these data that I find particularly fascinating is Roger Federer's who has a, a, a win rate of 67% in, in when he gets to Grand Slam um, finals. So 33% of the time, Roger Federer fails. But we can't describe him as a complete failure because he wins 67% of the time. We can't describe him as a complete success because he fails 33% of the time. So taking away labels, I think, is really key when, when we're thinking about how to coach people through, through a culture of... Um, a culture that makes fair acceptable. I think it's about helping the individual to accept themselves as a person and an athlete, not necessarily accepting failure, if they, that makes a bit of sense. We want to drive them really hard. Um, and we want to drive them uh, to the best they possibly can, but at the same time accept themselves when they, they don't do as well as they thought and, and create a culture that still values individuals for individuals, not just as athletes not just as performance um, machines, you know, which are, are, are sometimes seen in some books I've worked in. So it, it's a, it is a fine balance, and I suppose I've given you there the REBT answer, you know, and th- different things work for different people. But if you're, if you're practicing under an REBT framework, that's the way to go, I believe. And I, I, I it's interesting as you're talking there, um, I'm thinking about having conversations with coaches and coaches saying to me, but my job is to, especially coaches that are either elite coaches or striving to help players progress towards elite, they'll say, but but Dan, my job is to stretch. You know, my job is to 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 push them, um, and and I always talk to the to, to coaches about stretching within activities. So, making making the activities as tough as they possibly can, you know, within reason, um, so that errors will happen, but supporting the players. So that balance between stretch and support, stretching players through tough activities on the pitch or the court or the course but providing support through your voice and also providing support by guiding the inner voice of the player yeah exactly you're trying to as you described there create tough demanding environments that try and get try and you know get as close as you possibly can to performance with the knowledge that you'll never get you know 
ultimately you'll never get to that performance um, difficulty. But you can create really tough performance environments. You can create environments that are tougher than what they might experience. You can never be 100% accurate because there's uncertainty that's involved in, in a live performance situation. But you can really can create very tough situations. And through that, through um, you know, individuals experiencing failure through tough situations, there's a learned and I think can we encourage players to reflect on those situations and to understand exactly what they have learned at a, at a, at a, a psychological level, you know, at a psychological level, well, what did I take from that situation? How am I going to deal with the fact that um, I failed a bunch of times and I underperformed and I'm, I, I let some teammates down? How am I going to square that away? Uh, what's the quickest and most appropriate way to do that? And I think it's very difficult to train those skills if we're not in a, in a demanding environment, if we're just talking theoretically all the time and saying, well, imagine when something does happen, how do you think you would do this? And here's some ideas. I think it, it goes hand in hand with creating demanding, tough environments. Um, yeah, I completely agree with you there. I'm going to finish on a, on a quote um, from Rory McIlroy. I think it was from this year. I think it was from the Open at Carnoustie. Um, but... Um, I'm happy to be corrected, but McElroy said, I remember when I last opened open here, uh, I was just happy to be here. I was just happy to be here. I was bouncing down the fairway. I didn't care if I shot 82 or 62. The more I can get into that mindset, the better I play golf. The more I can get into that mindset, the better I play golf. And... You know, in my work over the last 15 years, I just think what McElroy said, said there is such a truism. And it's an enormously difficult, chilling place for competitors to get into. Uh, and just sort of going back to some of the things we've spoken about in the last 50 minutes, hour, you know, I work with players, so many competitors, some of whom have been the best in the world or are the best in the world, who want so badly to stay there or to get back up there or get to world number one or to be in that Barcelona side or Manchester United side. And, and it's so challenging for them to recognise that actually we take a step back and I stop placing my mental intensity in that direction and I actually choose to place it in the direction of the things whether you describe it as as what you can control or um, whether it's on the process uh, however you direct it I just think what McElroy said there is so pertinent and and it's and it's and it also alludes to the constant battle in his mind of of I know I know I need to actually work out my performance I know I need to relax about the outcome I know I can't be obsessed about what I should I know that that's the best place for me to be, but you know what? I'm logically I'm working so hard on this every single day. That's a tough place to get into. It is, yeah, definitely, and it, it's one of those things that I think does come with experience. One of the things we know from the data is um, that older people have less irrational beliefs. There's something about going through life and facing adversity that, that teaches you that failure isn't fatal, and you know, underperformance isn't terrible. There is a natural thing that occurs. But I suppose what we're trying to do is help people to fast forward that and teach them some skills and principles that allow them that insight earlier on rather than later on. I think there are, the other aspect is, um, you know, just because you want something doesn't mean you have to have it. You know, you could want something more than anything in the world. There's no evidence. There's nothing written. There's nobody to say that you have to have it. And I think when I, when I think about that McElroy quote and, and the things McElroy said in the past as well, um, who I would consider a very rational thinker um, by an RBT definition, what strikes me as well. He really wants to succeed. He recognises the importance of it, but he, he's not placing those demands on himself. And it's such a difficult place to get to because you have to really, really want something but not spill over into demanding things of yourself and things of the environment. You know, when we think about what, what an irrational belief is, it's I want it and therefore I must. The preference is attached to the demand because you want something, you think you must have it. What you're trying to do is decouple it and saying that must is something different. 
that's not part of what you want. It's not part of your motivation. It's something different. It's almost an external factor. So just because you want something doesn't mean say you have to have it. I think that's as a mantra um, for people to take into performance situations is a very difficult, but B can be very rewarding. In my work, I, 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 I'll use some tools and techniques from REBT and I'm, I'm, I'm down at 10% as compared to your 100% of being well versed on our REBT. You're using it on a daily basis. But the way I might, and I say might because you know as a consultant, you know as a practitioner that when you get in the room with that golfer or tennis player that the situation might be completely different. What I might be doing with McElroy, again I come back to, and in golf here, golfers are so socialised into outcome by that, I mean score, I mean um, position in the field. They're so socialised into performance in terms of... Uh, got to play my A game, got to strike that ball bang on, you know, got to hit the fairways, got to hit the greens, got to hit it in close. That's how I, if, if we're at McElroy's level, that's how I win, that's how I win money. And that's where, placing, for me, incorrectly, they're placing their intensity, a mental intensity, that's where they're placing their motivation, that's where their focus of attention is. If their intention is there, that's where their attention is. And when they go out in the golf course and they hit a few bad shots, bang it collapses because what's happened uh, in reality is different to what they wanted to happen and so their emotions go haywire so the conversation I'm having and this is probably similar but kind of fractionally divorced from maybe the way you'd go about it I'm having that conversation with McElroy around well okay fine we know we want to win we know we want to shoot a great score to do that, you've probably got to play your A game, or you've got to get the money your A, B, C, D game. I work on that a lot. That tends to be my framework with golfers. But how are we going to do that? And I'll draw it back down to whether it's, the, again, I come back to what you can control, but I'm drawing it back down to the process. What can I do? What choices can I make? You know, I, I can choose to execute my strategies. I can choose to execute my routine. I can choose to react and respond in a certain way, an adaptive way to shots. So I'm trying to get golfers, trying to help golfers, I should say, get away from those thoughts about, for me, irrational thoughts about outcome and performance and more onto the process, the things that I know I can come, go and choose and I can do. It might be a difficult choice. Hey, it might be a difficult choice. But I want energy and intensity and intention around those things. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, we talk about, a lot about focusing on process rather than um, outcome. And it, it sounds, it's a weird thing, you know, it sounds like a cliche, doesn't it? Because it's, it's so well, yes. uh, you know, but but, but it, it, it really is a truism. That, yeah. you know, is there any point on match day, on game day, um, to talk about winning or the outcome? To an athlete who, you know, this is their job. This is a, an, an occupational truism do we need to say well we want to win today do we need to even mention the result or do we just focus completely on process how far do we go down that, that route um that, that fascinates me quite a lot i mean rbt um the rbt perspective would be on process you know it would be on process it would be you know don't think too far into the future you can't predict the future you can't mind read um so we we try to yeah focus on that that process and what are some of the mechanics involved in that process and how nitty gritty can an athlete get? I think the, the tricky thing is, is on the one hand focusing on process, but on the other hand, not focusing on mechanics, especially in, in sports like golf, where you start to focus on mechanics and, and things can go south pretty quickly. So it's trying to have a, a, a really accurate conversation with athletes about, well, what is, what does, what do the processes look like and how do we stop them from going into the mechanics of a shot? Um, well, yeah, I, it, it, yeah, absolutely, and I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm trying to, as the interviewer here, I'm trying to avoid going into another half an hour conversation because I, I think we could, we could go off on one here. But I, I think that you know the way I would deal with that is, is I actually make if a, if we're talking golf specifically, and if a player likes to have a swing thought or feeling, and clearly if that player has four, five, six swing thoughts or feelings, or starts to question their swing thought or feeling, then that's a problem. But if a player 
has a swing thought or feeling, that's fine to me. I mean, I can bring that in as part of their process. That's no problem at all. I, I think that that is, uh, if a player says, well, I've got to keep a one-piece takeaway. I can, having been a pro golfer, I can get as technical as I want here, but, uh, you know, I, I, I want to have a, a, a takeaway that's one-piece. That, that, that's a process to me. I've got absolutely no issue with that. Um, it's just uh, probably as you'd agree, it's when you start questioning that and start going off on tangents related to team, that's when it becomes very dangerous. That's it. I mean, processes can be holistic as well. You know, Absolutely. Working with um, an athlete who at the moment who uh, is a shooter and in the latter um, parts of the competition starts to struggle with attention, starts to get tired. And that opens up a conversation about, OK, how are you sleeping? What are the processes we can put in place to allow you to get higher quality sleep, even if it's not higher duration, how can we help that higher quality sleep? You know, what are processes are you going to put in place to allow it to happen, which then has the knock-on effect of you potentially um, feeling greater energy when you're in competition. So that process doesn't just happen um, on the field of play, does it, I suppose? It, it's everything that the athlete does throughout their, their day-to-day. What processes can they put in place that when they turn up to a competition, gets them to where they need to be to get the best out of themselves. Um, and I think the, the, the more that we do that and the more that we just turn away from outcome a, a little bit, because you know, it's always there, it's always in the room. If we can steer a conversation towards process, then I think that, that's, that's a more fruitful conversation from my perspective. And I think what we've together brilliantly done there martin is we we've, we've set ourselves up for a conversation in six months time or a year's time and return to that idea of process and its relationship to rebt so i'm conscious of your time and 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 it's been a fantastic conversation i know i've learned a lot as somebody who takes an active interest in rebt and you've, got, <laughs> you've demonstrated how much more i need to know and learn uh, about this area i think it's absolutely fascinating and i, I know that we're going to get a lot of I'm sure we're going to get a lot of comments on on Twitter and various social media platforms and I welcome them because I know coaches will still have a great deal of um, a great deal of questions around this notion of 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 rational thinking and 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 dealing with the musts and the awfulizing and the overgeneralization so with that in mind uh, Martin how can how can people get in touch with you? Because I'm sure there's going to be some some people who who want to based on our conversation. Yeah, they can um, get me on Twitter. Um, my handle is at Dr MJ Turner, and um, also there's we have um, a website which is thesmarterthinkingproject.com, which we push blogs out around using RBT and performance. It's very um, RBT based, um, so they can check that out as well. And I, I suppose. It, um, just like to say in closing is that you know as a practitioner I'm, I'm still learning how to how to translate this information to the sporting environment to coaches to athletes and to other practitioners as well and when you're trying to take theory you make like something which is very um, complicated in, in depth and try to make it usable um, co- questions from coaches questions from athletes challenges and queries are only helpful you know, to challenge us as practitioners to, to make this stuff, you know, come out of textbook and into the field. So I'll certainly welcome any questions and comments um, about this area from anybody. Fantastic. And I, I for one, can can say to everybody listening in that, that, that the, the blogs and the posts on the blogs are brilliant. I know I've learned. I keep up with it and I, I've, I've learned quite a lot from some of those articles. So do have a look there. So, Dr. Martin Turner, thank you very much uh, for joining me and and have a a great rest of the day. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. That was Dr. Martin Turner. Some really interesting concepts, and I'm confident there'll be a lot there that's new to coaches. I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. If so, please leave a review, and remember you can subscribe to the show to receive updates about future episodes. I hope you can join me next time. Bye for now.